everyone, and welcome to Worlds Tonight, the last one here from the quarterfinals and from Guangzhou, as I am joined by Frost Curran and Azale to break down what happened today. And I think, obviously, WE took it home in the end, but we have to be happy again that it was an amazing series as we've had so many already in the quarterfinals. I feel like we've had the best worlds ever as far as unpredictability, as far as you know the level of competition between the different regions, the unique picks coming out consistently and surprising us. It's been really exciting the whole way through. And I know it's a dead horse, but I'm going to continue to beat it one more time. I actually do think that the gap has significantly closed. Not only are we getting incredibly competitive and compelling best of fives between NA, EU, and the LPL, but also between Korea and EU. Yeah, definitely. That's a great opening statement looking ahead to the semifinal but let's focus in on what happened today. And I'd also like to take a moment to just to apologize again for the technical issues we suffered today, but the teams did leave it all on the rift. It went all the way to five games, but Team WE was victorious in the end, Frost Current. So, well, you can have a little woohoo here now for a moment. Oh, no, I was definitely clinching for, like, <laughs> at least four of those games. Game number one in particular, I was shocked that Team WE managed to win that. And then it was also the concern that I felt like it was a mis-execution from Cloud9 that they 100% should have won it. Their early game was beautiful as we take a look at, you know, repeated dives. I think the, the target focus was great. But simply when it came to executing on that mid-game, that's where they fell short. And then it gave Team WE kind of this inflation sense of confidence that they could just continue to play the same style. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I do think that the early game was fantastic. I thought the Aurelian Soul made a lot of sense when you have this pushing bot lane with the Caitlyn, you can go down there, snowball that lane, and they were able to do so, but yeah, Cloud9, in the mid-game, as you said, it kind of stalled out. It felt like it was starting to go back towards WE until they then made some mistakes, and I think both teams certainly had their chances. This game, to me, at the end, really came down just to execution, though, as there was you know a few major errors from Cloud9 uh, that really kind of stopped them from taking that game. Well, in many ways, this was also like the first game in a series where both teams are maybe a bit jittery, uh, but it was WE that took it. And then when we go into the rest of the series, one person that was constantly b dishing out the damage, I, I wasn't quite sure how to say that, Sneaky in that first game as well. I think he probably realized that he could have done much more than it, and it was up to C9 to get, pick themselves back up. I mean, he had a, a pretty incredible game overall. There was a few big mistakes that people are going to focus on, you know, dying actually mm -hmm. to the Kog'Ma. It, he didn't use his barrier, but also, you know, Lulu did not use ultimate or heal. He we got didn't two see, shot. Yeah, I mean, he, he got burst extremely fast. We didn't see a locket coming out from Contracts either, so certainly mistakes there, but overall he played an incredible game, you know, putting out the DPS record on a champion that people do not consider to be good in the late game anymore, and I think that he showed just how dominant the pick still can be. And I also want to give credit to his partner in crime and Smoothie there. Uh, Smoothie kind of flies under the radar a lot. It's really tough when he's on a team with someone mm -hmm. like Jensen who's going to absorb so much of that spotlight and so much of the uh, the compliments there. But Smoothie, his Jana game in particular, I'm thinking about that one play bottom where she yeah, literally flashed into the bush and Smoothie was smart enough to put himself in the brush knowing that it wasn't warded so he couldn't be seen, hits a beautiful tornado and then monsoons immediately. The amount of damage and the amount of time that he bought his team in that single play was brilliant. It was, and it also brought on, I feel like, a monsoon of confidence for that bottom lane, because in games two and three, we saw Smoothie. Yeah, I sneaky. like that. I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Don't point nice. it out. Just let it live. Let it breathe. <laughs> but I feel like we're going to see this play also uh, in this replay of the two games that followed, because C9 was unchained. Yeah, and here's the thing is, this is where I thought that this was the kind of false confidence that Team WE had gathered from the first game. They're like, ah, the Kogma composition seems to be working. But you shouldn't have won that first game, so I don't know why you're trying to run it back in game number two. And Cloud9 were like, okay, pump the brakes. We're back in the series. Yeah, and in game number three as well, I think I think Cloud9 played incredibly well in this bot lane. You had to give a lot of credit to Sneaky and Smoothie. They're playing into this lane that's oh, there supposed it is. to be kind of this losing lane. And they were down in farm, they're getting pressured, but they found opportunities to actually all in and really turn the lane around. And, you know, I also have to give quite a bit of credit because I think that Reaper in the early games, I think his drafts were fantastic. I actually felt that Cloud9 outdrafted WE in the first four games. And it's kind of unfortunate that almost all the attention he gets is probably going to be about this fifth game draft, which uh, really was kind of tragic. Uh, it, definitely, it's not just you who believes that. Reaper 100% outdrafted Team WE for the majority of the series. That said, we got the Galio game. You guys mm -hmm. got the, uh, the Maokai jungle game. So yeah. I think... It <laughs> Pretty even, right? Yeah, it was yeah, yeah. even. And if we look at the story of the games, obviously, number one onto WE, landslide victories for C9. And then you think, you know, as an NA fan, as they'll probably, the boys just have to lock it up now. So what in the end changed going into that game four and five, not disregarding the, the, the draft of game five, but that game four where they should have taken it? I mean, I simply think it's just a matter of execution. I think that 
the team that makes the fewest mistakes generally wins in League of Legends. I think WE made a few less mistakes throughout the series. I think that they had better execution when it came down to it in the team fights and in those critical moments, really a series like this is just one or two small mistakes between winning and losing the series. And once you make those mistakes, C9's composition is incredibly difficult to execute from behind. Mm. Having a Taric, you know, it, it's so hard to play that pick reactively. You have to play it proactively and have the goal to engage freely. I, I definitely agree, but even in game four, I felt like they had such a better scaling composition. And even from you know, about 10,000 gold behind, they were starting to fight back in the team fights, but obviously didn't end up winning that one. Game five, though, I, I do want to talk about the draft a little bit because this one to me was, you know, a complete breakdown in the draft phase and you know I'm not sure where the decisions were as far as giving over Galio, Janna and Kogma, but to me you either have to ban away the Galio to disrupt a composition like this, or you should not have been picking Caitlyn because they essentially drafted themselves into a corner where you have this bot lane that has to kind of smash lane, but then how are you supposed to be able to push against Gragas who has early ganking that's so powerful and a Galio who can roam down there and shut down anything or TP on you, you know, very early in the game as well. So they kind of painted themselves into this corner and I felt like this would be such a different game if this is a Janna first pick for WE and a Galio Kogma going over to C9 because that sets yourself up for kind of the ultimate composition where you also get Lulu who is on the board and I thought that that was such a failure in their draft in game five and uh, they gave themselves very few ways to win. I do want to flip it to kind of the other side because I do agree that the Galio was the issue but I think there are uh, you know viable things to pick or play into it you know maybe uh, Malzahar. Yeah maybe Jensen was theoretically looking at the Malzahar, but there's also just the idea that if your win condition is playing around the bottom lane, there's still other picks, you know, uh, heavy Rome champions like the Talia or even the Rise, even though that hasn't been really the trend for Western teams, um, but just anything that could have gotten down there that could have, you know, snowballed with mm. Sneaky and Smoothie. I think it was the fact that they were missing that component and the Galio was yeah. there. And I also want to turn it on its head and now look towards what WE did well in this series. And there were a, a couple of things. I had an interview with Mystic Frost, and he said, I don't actually think I did that well today. I think Shia was pulling a lot of the weight for the team. But we cannot deny that Mystic is such an unstoppable force it, on a handful of picks in and, that bottom lane. Yeah, and that's the thing. You know, CA looked great on his two big champions, Galio and Talia, who doesn't look great on Galio, though. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that Mystic is, you know, being hard on himself and, and being humble, because frankly, usually he's not. Uh, but that said, this guy, statistically, in every pretty much measurable number can be in the conversation for best ADC at the tournament. His numbers are absurd. I definitely agree that when you're looking at the tournament as a whole, you know, he's up there. But to, for me today, I don't think he was super impressive. I think that he certainly had very good moments. And a lot of it, I think, was kind of being enabled by the composition. When you look at a game five where he doesn't have to worry so much about positioning because he can eat shockwaves and be protected by that composition. And when you think about the winning lanes that were drafted for them when they had Caitlyn Lulu and they lose, you know, in the 2v2 to this John and Tristana. So certainly there were some times where... I think a better team probably would have capitalized on that and taken the series. And, you know, Mystic to me has such a high skill ceiling. Like, he's such an incredible player. And I think for them in the semifinals to have a chance, he needs to be perfect. I, I feel that's what what he was alluding to because he said, well, if you th think of what the better bottom lane was, you looked at how we die 2v2, then you know, right? But it's also how you are resilient and step up and still perform in those team fights. And I think when it comes to Team WE, we talked about adaptability. We talked about not making a lot of mistakes. But if you flip it around, if they they see one chance, one window, one door that's open a little bit. They just go in and almost finish the game straight off that. And that is just so wonderful to see. Yeah, they kick it in, certainly. Yeah. Uh, and that's the thing about Team WE and why they have been such a dominant team in the LPL this entire season. It's the fact that you cannot afford to make any mistakes, which mm -hmm. in the LPL, teams make a lot of <laughs> mistakes. And they just play kind of this tortoise in the hare style where, yeah, it's slow and steady. It's not super flashy. You know, sometimes they'll come out if Condi has a great early game and uh, Shea is playing Lucian or something and like solo kill Faker and suddenly it's like, wow, Team W, you're a great early game team. Nah, most of the time they just kind of sit back and they just wait for you to make a mistake and then capitalize. And the truth of the matter is, you know, you can kind of joke about, oh, LPL makes a lot of mistakes. Which region has not made a, a ton of mistakes this tournament? There is no team that has, has looked flawless. There's no team that has looked even close to flawless. Samsung, you can talk about their brilliant quarterfinals, but in groups, there was a plethora of mistakes. Longju, perfect in groups, perhaps, but 
so many holes in, in the quarterfinals, right? So really, if you can perfect that style, if you can minimize your own mistakes and kind of wait for your opponents, it seems like an effective way to win right now. It is. So let's take a look at that bracket and who we think might make the least mistakes out of those matchups. Team WE goes on to face Samsung. And when I asked the guys about it, um, Shia said, I'm very confident. We're all better than Samsung. We can beat them. Froskerin, what is it going to come down to? Uh, it's going to come down to consistency on the day and playing up to those ceilings. Uh, I have no doubt that a team like SKT, a team like Samsung, we're always going to give the Korean teams, the LCK, the benefit of the doubt and say that they have the higher ceilings, but we really haven't seen that consistency from them. Samsung struggled in groups, came out second seed. Yes, they looked great against Longju, but that's a team that they have such a tenured history facing in the LCK. They have way more, uh, you know, advantage or preparation time because they constantly face the team. And SKT on the other side are looking very shaky. So this is probably the closest closest semifinals that we've probably ever had. Yeah, it's, it's honestly very hard to tell, I feel, across the board, because although Samsung looked incredible, it also felt to me like Longju completely collapsed. It felt like they were not playing as themselves. You know, they were making a ton of mechanical errors. They're making a ton of, you know, decision errors as well, uh, things that were very atypical of some of their players. You know, when you look at BDD and you talk about, oh, this is the guy that never dies, and then seeing some of the mistakes he's made to, making to give away deaths, it does make you question a little bit just how good is Samsung? You know, are they that much better, or was Longju kind of just having a bad day? Uh, so I do think that both the matches could be close. If I'm looking just at quarterfinal form, I, I have to favor Samsung. And, you know, on the other side of the bracket, I feel like both RNG and SKT had a lot of mistakes. But, you know, does SKT get the benefit of the doubt for preparation any longer when in the quarterfinals they were one team fight away from losing to Misfits, right? They were depending on Misfits to make a mistake oh, on that dive. I mean, the, the name <laughs> of SKT is pretty much absorbing so much blowback for them. If that was any other team, we would be mm -hmm. so much harsher with them on the analyst desk in the cast. But because it's SKT, the repeated mantra is, oh, it's SKT, you know, give them the benefit of the doubt. We know that they can do it. And Faker, yeah, he's playing up to that SKT standard, but the rest of his team, frankly, isn't. I'd say Huni, I think, had, had great quarterfinals. He's you know, I would a lot give him better. that credit as well. Um, but I certainly agree that the bot lane really was underperforming, and it's almost comical to compare Peanut of this year to Peanut of last year. It's like a, it's it's sad. You know, it's yeah. it's a shell of his former self almost uh, to the bing point. Bengi shell. Yeah, they just like <laughs> put him in the meat grinder and I mean, put him in the mold. It looks worse than Bengi, you know, because it, he's playing a style I think that doesn't really fit him. And it's something that it feels like the team is either asking him to do or whatever, but it's, it's not working out. Well, we'll see how they can uh, get back on that horse. And as said, never bet against SKT. But on the other hand, Frosker, two LPL teams in the semifinal. It almost seems like everything's being restored, right? The pride they once had, they're playing phenomenally at moments. But there are a lot of question marks still. But here, in front of their own crowd, it's going to be in Shanghai, a packed house. It feels like it's theirs for the taking. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. This is my excited face. This is as happy <laughs> as it gets. Like, I am excited for the LPL. It is cool to be like, oh, yeah, you know, this is the, the return of the LPL. We had the collapse of 2015, the rebuilding of 2016, and finally 2017. It's like, yep, we're Ooh. back on, you know, silver, second place. We've got it. But that said, realistically, and I fundamentally believe this, if that was, you know, misfits in this uh, this situation or even Cloud9, I still think those semifinals are close. Like, I, I don't think that the gaps are actually that large. It was so close for even Fnatic versus RNG, and that was, what, a 3-1 series? And there were more multiple games that Fnatic could have won that. So, uh, yeah, I'm happy that the LPL is here, but I think it's just as much confidence in the Western teams as well. I definitely agree, but it always feels like it's a day yeah. late and a dollar short, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's just that close. It Seven is. years. <laughs> Seven years in the making. We'll see, by the way, the Pickhams are still alive. Our one guy has SKT to win the whole thing. So we'll see what happens in the semifinals. That will do it here from the quarterfinals in Guangzhou. It's been an amazing run, some amazing series, and hopefully two more next week. See you then. Legends never die. They become a part of you Every time you play for reaching Greatness, relentless you Sunny almost goes down as well Actually, Jennifer still fighting Shia But that, boom, bad times there The voice of light, they light oh! Jensen snipes him down Cena looking for a Jensen in a tank A few towers, it's an impact He's gonna go in next Tornado down, Mystic flashed out of the stuff But Ben, not so lucky Turn his contract, he makes his way in Jensen He's so late, he's targeting right
Ryan Spears ulti. Five turns, oh. gets on, Ben goes down. Bottom lane falls for WE. Oh, my God. Oh, oh my goodness, I call Mystic Jensen. I'm going to grab the shot wave and the assassination. Now she, the next to go down. Jensen with a crucial double kill. And the next is open as Cloud9 tied up. Gentlemen, we have a series. If I going to take one, go ahead, make it two. Oh, my God, that rock yeah. is amazing. First one, nine, five, seven. That heal may save his life with the And the down is got him. Sneaky gets the kill. They're going to go for two. Mystic, no summoners left. Sneaky outplays them. Sneaky still getting jumped up. Makes his way out. Condi goes down. And the last chance saloon is closing for WE. Game for C9 to tank line in particular to be tanking. Oh, the fight. And some Jensen. Condi gets that great shot there with the recover. C8 on a well-deserved killing spree. Smoothing falls against the Mystic. And the fight. Silence. Rock shot. Beast is all good for nine. After the invulnerability wears on contract, he's gonna get sniped as Mystic grabs himself the double. WE poised to take this inhibitor and the game. Okay, look, 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 look,